Coming up on this week's show, we talk to Avon Gale and Piper Vaughn about their new hockey romance, Goalie Interference. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 209 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com. And with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Will Knaus. Hello, everybody. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. We'll have more information on how you can join them at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we have coming up for you next week. Welcome back, everyone. Another week, another show. we got lots of fun stuff to talk about, so let's get to it. First, we would like to welcome a brand new podcast to the Gay Romance Block. Yes, the, the Gay Romance Neighborhood, as it were. Uh, we'd like to welcome Gay Romance Dot Show, the MM Author Podcast, hosted by Slade James. The premiere episodes went out just this past week and featured authors Daryl Banner, Lucy Lennox, and Lily Martin. There was also a great preview episode that kind of introduced Slade and how he found gay romance and why he started the show. I think it's safe to say we very much enjoyed what we've heard so far. And uh, you can check out all the details on that show at gayromance.show, because yes, that's also a URL. <laughs> <laughs> so be sure and give that one a listen. It's really good. Um, real quickly, this past week, uh, I partook of two movies that were not good at all, and I want to talk about them really briefly. The first one is Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Now, I am a child of the 70s, uh, so I grew up watching Godzilla movies and Ray Harryhausen movies and Universal Monster movies every Saturday afternoon. So I have very strong feelings about this sort of thing, uh, and Godzilla, King of the Monsters, just does not cut it. Uh, <laughs> there is a reason no one went and saw this this past summer. Um, now it should be said the monster stuff is actually pretty decent. I don't have a problem with that. The problem is with the actual human storyline. Um, they have a actually pretty respectable group of actors, but they are all forced to play incredibly un unlikable characters who have to say the most grotesquely stupid things. Um, so when half of your movie is taken up with, you know, stupid, unlikable people, it's like, yeah, you're in big trouble. Um, so unless you're a Godzilla completist, I do not recommend this movie. I have to say, as we were watching this, that I was surprised that you didn't actually start speeding up the film to get past the human babble and just watch the monster part, which I agree. The effects here and the monster stuff was pretty, pretty darn cool and kept me engaged for the film. The other movie that wasn't very good that we watched this past week is called Skate Town USA, and I purchased this one on Blu-ray. Let me explain why. Um, <laughs> there were three roller disco movies that came out in 1979 slash early 1980, and um, the most well-known, of course, is Xanadu. The other one is the Linda Blair classic Roller Boogie. And then there's Skate Town USA, and this is the movie that has never had an official home video release in the United States. And this is primarily because the movie is filled from beginning to end with disco and pop songs, and it would have been practically impossible to secure the rights to all that music for a standard home video release. Well, somehow, some way, they finally managed to do that, and the uh, movie finally made its de debut on Blu-ray. So I had to have it just out of curiosity's sake. And uh, holy cow, this movie is so very strange. I would liken it to watching the Star Wars Holiday Special. Mm, yes, that's exactly what it was like. <laughs> it's so incredibly bad, but you can't stop watching it because it's like, what in the world am I looking at? The movie itself uh, takes place over one night at an L.A. area roller rink. And our main hero is played by a guy named Greg Bradford, who is this 
slim toned bleach blonde guy who reminded me of like a falcon porn star from 1983 oh yeah i could see that too uh so he and his friend scott bayo have come to skate town usa to compete in their roller boogie contest uh and his main rival is played by none other than patrick swayze who is uh, a guy named ace and he is the leader of a local gang that <laughs> their entrance to the to the to the rink is nothing short of extraordinarily crazy. They're a bunch of roller skate wearing street toughs. It's so bizarre and so incredibly strange. Hooligans. I would call them hooligans. <laughs> um so this movie is really terrible, but uh, enjoyable in its own strange way. Um, if you are a roller disco completist like me, uh, I suppose you should probably try to see this movie. Or if you are a lifelong fan of Patrick Swayze, this is one of his earliest screen appearances. And um, <laughs> the, the part where he uh, actually competes in the roller disco contest, uh, it's kind of it's a, it's a strange kind of magic. I, I don't know. It really is. And yet, I will say in all seriousness, you can see the beginnings of what made Patrick Swayze a star, too, because he does command the screen when he's there. And there's even a sneak peek of a certain key scene from Dirty Dancing inside Skate Town Which USA. Is, it's so bizarre. It's so strange. <laughs> and you have to wonder, years later, when he was shooting Dirty Dancing, did he flash back on that moment? Uh, but you've left out that also Marsha Brady's in this movie. Horshack is in this movie. And so it's like you've got an entire ABC galaxy of stars <laughs> going on inside this film. And it's bizarre, people. Bizarre. <sighs> yeah. So if you're if you're tough enough. There you go. If you can handle watching the Star Wars Christmas special more than once, this might be a good movie for you. Hi. I'm Jay from the LGBTQ romance review blog, Joyfully Jay. At Joyfully Jay, we review tons of LGBTQ romance, as well as romantic fiction and nonfiction. We review ebooks, audiobooks, and even the occasional movie. We typically review about 18 books a week, so Joyfully Jay is a great place to hear about new releases, catch up on books you may have missed, and find some new favorites. In addition to our reviews, each weekday we host an author as our first post of the day. This gives readers a chance to learn more about new releases, get exclusive excerpts, find out about the author, and participate in great giveaways. Each author post on Joyfully J is exclusive, so you get access to book and author information you can't find other places. At Joyfully J, we love LGBTQ romance and are excited to share it with you. Stop by the blog at joyfullyj.com. You can also visit us on our Facebook group, The Joyful Jays. We'd love to have you join us. So something we watched this past week that we actually thoroughly enjoyed that we wanted to share with everybody is the series The Politician, which dropped on Netflix at the very end of September. Uh, the Politician is the first show to come to Netflix under Ryan Murphy's New Deal. And of course, Ryan is responsible for American Horror Story, American Crime Story, Glee, Pose, so many things on TV uh, that we love. And we were excited to try this out uh, because of its stellar cast, among other things. And I have to say, as I've kind of processed out this show over the last week since we, since we got through the first eight episodes, it's really hard in some ways to describe, too. At its core, The Politician is about a student body election happening at a ritzy prep school in, I think it was in L.A., right? Yeah, it's in L.A., and it's this little microcosm of American politics, really. You've got Ben Platt, uh, who is uh, from Dear Evan Hansen and from Pitch Perfect. He plays Peyton Hobart, a very well-to-do student who, as we find out in the very first scene, he is going to be president of the United States. That's all he's ever, ever wanted. And to do that, he really must win student body president first. He has these advisors, he's got people around him to guide him on this journey, and it turns out his best friend, River, is trying to run against him, which really spirals out a whole bunch of stuff there. But as the series goes on, 
you get all of these stories about who he picks as his vice president, how his opponents change up. Once River drops out, River's girlfriend comes in. It's unbelievable the amount of stuff that goes on in here. His initial VP pick is a girl who also goes to school who everybody thinks she's got cancer, but that may not really be the case. Uh, her her grandmother, who's played remarkably by Jessica Lange, has uh, perhaps made the whole thing up. And so there's a whole side thing about, you know, coming through um, scandal in your campaign and, and the things that the families can do to your campaign, because Peyton has a really messed up family. He's an adopted. He's been adopted into a very rich family uh, with his parents of uh, Bob Balban and Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, he's got brothers who would rather off him. It's it's a twisted, messed up Ryan Murphy thing that was ridiculously fun to watch, and also under and also at the same time in its heightened reality. I think any number of things that went down in that show could end up and be in my Twitter news feed because they're believably unbelievable. The main criticism that I've seen online has been focused on primarily Ryan Murphy type things. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And that is true. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, it goes without saying, if you're not a fan of Ryan Murphy and the stuff he likes to produce then this show probably is not for you but uh if you do uh check this out it's a very strange mix i think ryan murphy has a tendency to produce shows that are on one side or the other of a certain spectrum either there is sort of uh intelligent drama things like assassination of johnny versace or normal heart Uh, But on the other side of the spectrum, there is the candy-colored insanity of things like Glee or Scream Queens. And this show doesn't really straddle the line between the two. I think it veers back and forth Mm -hmm. between those two extremes. Uh, And so uh, depending upon your predisposition (laughs) to the kind of characters that Ryan Murphy likes to write about, uh, you'll be into that. I think... At the end of the day, we were. Um, Peyton Hobart is an actually an anti-hero. He's pretty unlikable. But whereas I found Rachel Berry on Glee the worst human being on planet Earth, I think primarily because Peyton is played by Ben Platt, I found him palatable um, and intriguing. So I think thought that that definitely worked um i'm sure not everyone is going to have the the same opinion on that but i think what was interesting is is that in the last three episodes of the series um it takes a really odd left turn uh and it goes off into a really strange space (laughs) um uh there is not one but two assassination attempts on Peyton's life. And then the final episode in episode eight, um, the series flash forwards uh, to a time when all of the series regulars are now out of high school and living in New York. And episode eight sort of serves as a pilot episode for season two, which is entirely different than what we've just been watching. Um, So yeah, the show is interesting uh, and intriguing, but a little schizophrenic. The, the time jump was very interesting, and yet does set up a very interesting season two because we find not only of the as the most of the characters move forward into college and looks like they're seniors in college, but it also introduces uh, Judith Light as a New York senator and Bette Midler as her uh, chief of staff. And I can't wait to see season two because of where everything gets set up. Uh, a couple other things just quickly that I loved here. There's an episode right in the middle of this called The Voter, which takes a complete turn out of what we've seen so far and focuses specifically on a normal kid at this high school who has not yet decided who he's going to vote for. And we learned all about him and both campaigns attempts to get him to be their vote. Uh, it was a riot. 
And also, I have to shout out Ben Platt's singing in this episode. Uh, he has a rendition of Joni Mitchell's River, which was excellent. He also does a song from Stephen Sondheim's Assassins and covers Billy Joel's Vienna. And in episode two, also, uh, he plays the, pian- plays the piano in his house. And it's a song from his Sing to Me Instead album, which I have to say is even more poignant when you know what the lyrics to the song Runaway are. Uh, I was sitting there sobbing uh, because it was so, it was like a perfect moment that I think helps you like Ben more because it's an anti Rachel Berry moment for him that he does feel more than just like this drive to be a politician. So if you want to check this out, the first, the eight episode first season is out on Netflix now. And where it is, season two starts filming this fall for a 2020 premiere. So we like the politician and uh, your, vol- your mileage may vary. So you're jumping into Halloween time in your reading. Yeah, I decided to go paranormal for the month of October, and the book that I read this past week was called The Vampire's Club by X. Aratari, and this is the first book in this particular series. It focuses on a guy named Lucas, and he's sort of a a down-on-his-luck 20-something, and he's looking for work in the town called Arkham. It's the end of the day, and he hasn't had much success. When he notices a place that he supposedly had walked past before, but he's just noticing for the very first time. It's this enormous old building that takes up an entire city block, and it's called Club Diaval. And he's somehow compelled to go inside and search out a job. He's thinking, oh, maybe I can be a bar back, or maybe I can, you know, bust tables, something like that. Meanwhile, inside uh, is our vampire hero, a guy named Constantine, and he runs the club. The only problem is, is that he's been cursed. His senses have been heightened, which means that he feels everything incredibly intensely to the point of pain. So he essentially has sequestered himself in his tiny little office where there's very little light and very little sound, and he watches the club down below on a series of monitors and his sort of like right hand woman is a little vampire girl named Lizzie. She might look 11, but she's actually quite old and actually very, very smart. They're watching the security feed outside and Constantine notices this human standing out there across the street. And it seems like he's looking at the club. And he's paying attention to the club. And that shouldn't be the case because the club is actually protected by a series of spells to keep it hidden from prying human eyes. (laughs) Lucas (laughs) trots right up to the front door and comes right on in and uh, attempts to look for work. Now, seeing a human inside Club Diaval isn't all that rare or peculiar because vampires bring in their human friends and (laughs) people who provide uh, companionship and, of course, blood. So Lucas tries to fill out an application. (laughs) Uh, But Constantine uh, quickly has him swept away by security before he can cause any problems or suspicions among the other vampire guests. Uh, He's taken downstairs and made to take a shower. The reason being is that because of Constantine's heightened senses, even a human who smells normal is going to be particularly smelly and overwhelming. So so once he gets all scrubbed down, uh, he's taken to Constantine's little office and they sit down and they have a chat. Constantine is is drawn to him. He's partially uh, worried how did this human first of all, know the club was here, and how did he get past security? But he's also drawn to him and intrigued to him. What makes this guy so very special? But poor Lucas, he's utterly clueless. There was a little voice inside his head that told him to go inside, but other than that, he really has no clue what's going on. So they sort of banter back and forth until... Constantine finally decides that he's going to have to suck this kid's blood in order to figure out what his true deal is. Do you remember in True Blood where vampires could drink the blood of a human and get like their entire like backstory and life history? 
Oh, yeah. They did that a couple times. So this is kind of like that situation. Okay. So Constantine bites Lucas's neck. Uh, but strangely enough, he doesn't get any read at all from him. But what's also very interesting is, is that Lucas has a strange, unique taste to his blood. And his blood actually reduces some of the pain that uh, Constantine's curse causes. So, oh gosh, this kid, he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a mystery. Constantine's companion, Xavier, who sort of serves as a vampire historian, is incredibly worried because there's uh, a lot of politics going on behind the scenes with Club Diaval and a bunch of other uh, highfalutin, high-powered vampire people coming into town for a yearly meeting. I'm, I'm really describing it poorly. It's actually much more intelligently world built in the story. And did the world building work for you? Because we know historically that world building at times is not your favorite thing. It actually worked really, really well because the writing in this particular book is actually very detailed and really interesting. So no, the world building did not annoy me. Excellent. <laughs> So Ex kudos to the author for that one. <laughs> so Xavier wants to keep Lucas essentially prisoner in order to figure out all the different things going on with him. But Constantine doesn't feel that way. He doesn't want to keep this young kid as a blood slave. So essentially they glamour him. And when Lucas wakes up, he's on a train ride home. And he remembers a very odd situation sitting at a booth in the club and they're feeding him cookies and juice. <laughs> and he's trying to answer questions uh, during a job interview. <laughs> the thing that still gets me is that he took a shower for the job interview. I know. Did that bother him at all? This, this poor kid. <laughs> Once he gets off the train, he's very excited because the next day he's going to go back to the club for his first day on the job. What the author managed to do in this particular story, um, since it takes place in such a condensed time frame, uh, it just happens over the course of a single night, is that it really pulls you in to Lucas's experience and Constantine's POV. And like I said, there's a lot of detail going on in a relatively short amount of time and sets up the rest of this story. It should be noted that this is only book one in a series. Uh, it's a continuing series, which means that each one ends on a cliffhanger. So I really recommend this book. I think it's a really terrific start, a really intriguing start. If paranormal is your thing, I highly recommend you check it out. Book five is going to be releasing on November 12th. And as far as I can tell, it is not the end. It's going to keep continuing. All right. Well, I'm, I am intrigued because this does play a little bit on True Blood and a little bit on a series that I remember called The Lair. There was a little bit of that in there, too, with the whole club thing and such. So I'm intrigued. And if you're intrigued and interested in learning more about the books or anything else we talked about in this week's show, all you have to do is go to the show notes page for episode 209 at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. Want to hang out with us between shows? Check us out on Facebook. You never know what we might post. News about book sales, bonus video content, and maybe even a live broadcast or two. Like us today at Facebook.com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast and see what we get up to next. So last week I reviewed Goalie Interference by Avon Gale and Piper Vaud. And this week I am so excited to welcome them to the podcast to talk about this great book and about the Hat Trick series, along with what they're working on coming up next. Avon and Piper, welcome to the podcast. It is so awesome to have you here to celebrate the release of Goalie Interference at the start of hockey season. Yay, thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. So I adored Goalie Interference so much. I mean, I reviewed it last week and kind of was just like all gaga over it. But for those who maybe missed that or need to hear it from you guys. Tell us what this book is all about in your words. 
when we were writing off the ice, we really, we both love goalies. Like, it's just a thing. We have goalie love. And we wanted to write a rivalry between two on the same team. It was just like, that was the initial idea, the kernel that started it all off. Yeah, that's where the initial idea came from. And we just worked to develop it from there. Um, figuring out at first like do we want them on the same team do we want them on opposing teams how's that gonna work and it just made more sense to put them on the same team for the time that they would get to spend together yeah and then it kind of just went from there and the characters Ryu was of course introduced and off the ice and then Emmett developed you know as we were plotting and we loved them both right away and their chemistry and their banter and everything else and yeah it was just a lot of fun to kind of take it and run with it uh, we liked making um, Emmett from the minor leagues because I love when uh, goalies get like their big break and get to move up from like the AHL. Mm-hmm. So I really wanted it to be this like hot shot goalie who was coming in with a lot of confidence, but also had like not a chip on his shoulder, but something to prove and mm-hmm. was really just gung ho about being the team starter kind of against the more like level headed guy who's already been there. So that adds some nice tension. Mm-hmm. You build so much tension in this book in so many ways. How did that manifest while you were plotting? How many stress points were you trying to come up with for these two? I feel like they did it. (laughs) Yeah, I I think so. Because, I mean, when we initially plotted, obviously we knew that who was going to be the starter was going to be the big point of contention between them. And then eventually we had to make the decision of, you know, what happens during the playoffs and um, go from there. And so those were the two big things that we initially came up with while plotting and everything else just kind of happened, you know, um, organically as we wrote. Mm -hmm. And I love how you handled time in this book because it's a standard, you know, word count, page count romance. And yet you covered the hockey season here. It's nice to have like kind of a like a idea of how much time needs to pass, but it's also kind of stressful because we would yeah and be like wait a minute they haven't played hockey in like three months what are we doing or like wait where are they right now or had a holiday just happened because it goes by so fast i think when you're playing it or or when you think about the season it's you know it's Mm -hmm. only so many months but then to write out the plot points of somebody getting in a relationship often doesn't happen in that small of a time period yeah, and we had to go back through the manuscript and mark like timelines like, okay, right now we're in October and right now we're in November and just mark the significant time periods. Otherwise, like she said, we'd be like, oh, wait, w- when are we in the season? What's happening? Did Christmas pass? Did Thanksgiving pass? You know what I mean? That had to be something that we had to be aware of and kind of track throughout the writing of the book because we wanted it to be the over the course of the season because that's kind of close to what we did for off the ice too obviously that one started a little earlier because of the summer classes and stuff but um you know the, the whole meat of the book happened mostly throughout the season itself so we kind of wanted to keep that as a theme too i love the diversity that you got here between ryu and Emmett. also it's something we don't see enough in romance anyway right seeing yeah. persons of color in these lead roles But honestly, it's also not that common in the NHL either to have persons of color. What was your origin for the pairing? As you noted, Ryu came from off the ice, but then in developing Emmett. Well, you know, I'm I'm Latinx and I consider myself a person of color. And uh, as a hockey fan, I mean, it's hard to deny that the league is extremely, extremely white. Like there are very few players of color and they're few and far between. You're, you're lucky if you get two on the same team and sometimes even one. And we wanted to because I also hockey romance in general tends to be very white uh, and I see very few characters of color. And so we wanted to focus on that. We wanted to make sure that we included some of the men of color that are actually in the game and playing and that who have played historically in the game. We wanted to just do a little nod towards them and also just because. I am a person of color. My whole family is made up of brown people, you know, various shades of brown. And we're beautiful, I think. And I just wanted to spread some of that love and and get some of that representation in there. So, um, you know, Ryu had already, we had already decided he was Japanese American in the first book. And then Emmett, yeah, he just kind of, I, I don't know when we decided that he would be a black man. We kind of just 
at one point while talking and plotting, we, we decided to go for it. And then, you know, the whole conflict with his father and the, the football aspect and all of that other stuff just kind of developed from there. And then we just went for it. We just really wanted to focus on two men of color in the sport, especially because the next book, it's once again back to two characters that are white. And so, yeah, we just, that was our main motivator there was just to get some representation out there in a, in a league that um, you don't see very many people of color playing in. Yeah, there are. I mean, there have been and are yeah. still. I think oh, we, yeah. do, we wanted to like be like, hey, there are color or mm-hmm. players of color out there. And I know um, Ryan Reeves is one of my favorite players mm-hmm. and he's black. And then I was thinking of the Blackhawks goalie. Was it Ray Emery? Yeah, him and Ryan Reeves especially and like Evander Kane were a couple of the ones I was thinking of. So we definitely wanted to introduce something a little less white. (laughs) And I liked a lot what you did with Emmett and his dad as well. And that whole dynamic. Actually, overall, I really like what you did with the parents in this story, both having kind of their own things going on with what their kids were doing. (laughs) Yeah, we definitely wanted there to be a conflict that made sense for them I think when you're someone who's a professional athlete, it is so hard to do. I mean, it's just impossible to like make it with the odds. It seems like there's so many hockey players, but really if you think about all the kids playing hockey, like to even get there, you have to be super dedicated. Um, And the idea of being that dedicated without entirely all the support was interesting to me. Um, And also having somebody understand sports, but then wanting you to play a different sport. I just liked the idea of that kind of like parental conflict with them where it was like, I want you to do what I did because you're a great athlete, but why do you want to do this sport that I don't like? Like, I just thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Or we both did. Now you're both hockey fans. What research did you have to do here? Because this was beyond the game itself because you really delved into a lot of training stuff that I, as a fellow hockey fan, really enjoyed reading. Piper is really good at that. I have to tell you, they were finding like links and putting it in the document for the head. What, what was that called, Piper? Like the, the head trajectory stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like I said earlier, we love goalies. I'm also kind of anal retentive and I like to research things. That's just my personality. So even before we started working on this story, I had done some reading about um, Devin Dubnik, who plays for the Wild. Um, as their goalie, and he had um, talked in a couple of interviews about how he went and did this head trajectory stuff and how it helped improve his game so much. So I read a couple of articles about that and just started looking into various ways that goalies train and what they do and how they try to improve over time. And yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it was like totally intensive research, but I did do some reading and research into it to see like what would be going on with them behind the scenes and what would a goalie try to approve upon and all of that stuff. And a lot of the whole tandem thing was something that one of my teams, I'm a Bruins fan and a Blues fan. One of the things the Blues did a couple years ago was that's how they were trying to figure out who their starter was through the whole season. They would do a tandem and they'd switch off the players so that like if Jake Allen got a win, then he got to start the next night. And if he didn't get a win, then the other one started. And we thought that was really interesting because you'd think that would ruin a team's mojo but it actually like it was it was interesting how that like affected their team and how they would go forward and play that way and i think we liked that idea for trying to get both of them like starting time yeah it just made me wonder how do you get chemistry going if you're constantly switching goalies like how does that work and it did seem to work pretty well for them you know throughout the season and that seemed like a good way to kind of ramp up the tension between our characters as well because if one of them had just been the starter from the get-go where would the competition be so yeah it just seemed like the most ideal scenario to have them actively competing with each other but also against each other throughout the season I, I like how it takes some of the workplace tropes we've seen in the past where you might have somebody in the corporate world vying for a position with the person that they're romantically linked to, but to see it in sports, which is so hyper competitive anyway, Mm -hmm. it just really amped the whole thing up and how they work to build a relationship while all this stuff is happening at work. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That would stress me out. There's no way. Right. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) But it also made for some of the best scenes in the book, too, which I'm not going to spoil, but that 
some of that push pull as they kind of root for each other, but then want it for themselves. And some of their internal dialogue on that is just epic. Yay. Hey, thank you. Now, for those who missed off the ice, and, and shame on them if they have, <laughs> tell folks a little bit about Tristan and Sebastian's story, because we see more of them in goalie interference. Tristan is a NHL player who has decided to take some classes in case he um, needs a career after hockey in case of injury or just retirement early or whatever, because hockey players don't tend to play super long. And so he's taking some classes at a local college in Georgia, and he ends up in a sociology class taught by Sebastian Cruz, and then they kind of end up having hots for each other, but don't do anything until um, Tristan's done with the class. And so it's kind of like Tristan's romance with a not even understanding sports, has never been to a hockey game, professor of sociology and how they sort of fall in love. And it was so sweet how Sebastian got to figure out hockey. (laughs) (laughs) And we have to give uh, some kudos to Kurt Graves in all this. Uh, Oh, yeah. So great. He's the voice of the hat trick series so far. His off the ice performance was excellent. And I've, I've heard the preview of goalie interference with him. And part of me wishes I hadn't read the book and, and had him read it to me instead. (laughs) Oh, I loved that sample so much. I was super excited to, uh, when they sent us that link, it sounds so good. So I'm looking for, uh, sometimes I get weird about listening to audiobooks of my own work because it gets me like this secondhand embarrassment kind of thing. I don't know. But um, yeah, I do love his voice so much that I probably will listen to that audiobook just to hear it um, and hear how he narrates the story. He did such a great job with Off the Ice, so I'm excited. I can listen to them of mine, but I can't listen to like any of the sex scenes, which yeah. is ridiculous because I wrote them. But like yeah. the second somebody starts reading one that I have written, <laughs> I can't I can't handle it. I remember the first time I ever listened to one, which was for Breakaway, and I was legitimately hiding under a blanket. I could oh. not handle hearing like him talking about the kissing. I don't even know why. Like it was so weird. I can listen to other people's audiobooks and that have sex scenes in them. Totally fine. But my own, nope. And with goalie interference in particular, the thing I want to hear is how he does the banter between Ryu and oh. from the angry stuff to the sweet stuff to some of the bedroom talk. It's what I'm going to end up and just listen to anyway, because I'm addicted to Kurt's voice. And he's just so nice. He did, um, my favorite thing is he did Whiskey Business, one of my books, which had all these puns about Gallows Grove was the name of the town. So they were like death puns and his last name is Graves. Ah! I don't know, Perfect. I just do it like that. Mm-hmm. He just managed to have like an, a perfect Kentucky accent. And I don't think he's from there, but he did such a good job. Yeah, I love how he makes every character sound totally different and yet and like recognizable and how he does that. That's just so impressive to me. Is there more hat trick coming? I think I heard you say a little something about a, another book as we were we were talking. Who Who gets to pair up or can you tell us? Oh, we can tell you because we've talked a little bit about it on Twitter. So we've talked about it and it's Daniel's book. And we're mid-writing it right now. He pairs up with a character that has uh, as yet not been introduced. Basically, it's him reconnecting with his childhood sweetheart that he had um, had crush on until he was about 13 when he moved away to, to join like a hockey developmental league up north because he's originally from Florida. So he reconnects with uh, a boy he knew and that was his best friend when they were kids and that they, he had their first kiss with at you know, age 13, that shy first crush, first love sort of thing going on. And they reconnect as adults. And yeah, it goes from there. There's dolphins involved because <laughs> Micah, Micah works for an aquarium. And it's um, not your typical aquarium. It's like re- rehabbing animals that are hurt, you know, sea turtles, all that kind of stuff. Dolphins, they rehab and re-release if, if possible. So um, he's a marine biologist and that's what he does. And yeah, it's it's probably to date going to be our sweetest story. There, There's a yeah. very different dynamic between them than there are with them. Um, Tris and Seb and also Ryu and Emmett, there's just a very, it's just very kind of like sweet and fun. And, you know, they've got this whole like, oh, we were friends before and we're reconnecting as friends, but we're also falling in love, like that whole thing's going on. So it's been a joy to write them and a lot different than writing the other two books for sure. But we wanted there to be a whole mix of like different kinds of, of stories. And, um, you know, and, and this one is so, it's like so cute. It's mm-hmm. really cute. It mm-hmm. sounds just adorable i mean somebody who works in an aquarium with dolphins and i love second chance stories sign me up when does this come out (laughs) oh Oh, 
it's, it's August 2020, so yeah, yeah, it's almost still a year away. Oh, um, oh my goodness. But, you know, we're working on it. Yep. Hopefully it'll be worth the wait. So does Hat Trick get to go beyond three, or are you stopping at the logical three? <laughs> um, well, never say never. Uh, I mean, we do have the Hat Trick. It was originally pl- plotted to be a trilogy, obviously. The Hat Trick is the whole three goals by the same player thing. So that was our initial plan. Um, but, you know, over the course of writing these books, we really, really fell in love with Morley yeah, so we much. Love him. <laughs> Mr. Trevor Morley, we love him. And I've seen some early reviews of goalie interference and people eagerly talking about they hope book three is about Morley. And we're kind of like, oh, but I know, you know, I feel bad. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> bad now that we don't currently have a plan to write his book. You know, that's not outside of the realm of possibility. It could just be a spin off, you know, standalone title that we decide to do eventually. So yeah, we'll see, we'll see. I could see a Morley book. I'd like to see somebody to come in and try to tame him just a little bit. So how did your writing partnership start? Well, we became friends when I started publishing and then was on Facebook and I had read some of Piper's books and then um, we became like Facebook friends. And then I realized they liked hockey and we made a bet. Do you remember this, Piper? And I, I lost. Do. And I had to have a Blackhawks icon ugh, for like a week. It was terrible. Yeah. Because um, they beat the Blues. And that was kind of how we started. I mean, that was kind of how we started like talking about writing. Because I'm like, I love writing hockey books. Want to write a hockey book? And then we just kind of went from there. I was new to hockey. I was just like brand spanking new with my training wheels on and didn't know a thing. And I just suddenly decided I want to write a hockey romance. And this was even prior to the conversation with Avon that we should work together. So, you know, naturally, when the subject of us working together on a hockey romance came up, I was very much excited to do so. And Blackhawks were the team that got me into hockey. They're the first team that I fell in love with. I've been to so many games. I have multiple jerseys. I've been to their practice arena. Like, I love them. I have a, a vial of the melted ice from when they won the cup the last time. Eventually, I moved away from them. Uh, Avon likes to say the team finds you, you know, the, the team yeah. of your heart finds you. And, and that is how it happened with me with the Wild. And then also the Blues. I really love them. And actually, Off the Ice, and we've talked about this in promo for Off the Ice before, was inspired by a Blues player, Colin Pareko, who was during the playoffs one season going to school, studying for finals. And we were just like so inspired by the idea of this hockey player like bringing his book along everywhere on the planes on the buses as yeah. they're going to games he's he's studying in the in the uh, the dressing room like all of that was just really inspirational to us we thought it was it made for such a good premise so that's how off the ice the original idea even began was we both like the blues we both love Colin Pareko and we loved what he was doing it was just I, I thought, like, just what dedication does it take to do that? So um, that's how the character of Tristan came about. We went from there. We just plotted it out and and then off the ice. <laughs> what got you into hockey, Piper? I mean, five years ago isn't that long. Yeah, um, what, what, what was the turning point for that? Okay, so this is kind of weird. I got a weird start in hockey, but I used to be on Tumblr all the time. And basically, I started falling in love with uh, a couple of players um, through like hockey RPF and that sort of thing and like memes and and interview clips. So one of those players was Jonathan Taze, of course, captain of the Blackhawks. And so when I was reading some of these stories, I suddenly just had this, like, I want to write hockey romance. I can do this. I want to do it. And then I had the moment of, like, but I don't know anything about the sport. I've never watched a game. I don't have a clue. So my husband's a longtime fan of hockey. Um, The Red Wings have been his favorite team since he was a kid. Um, He loves Steve Eiserman. I told him, I want to write a hockey romance, so you need to teach me about hockey. (laughs) And so it kind of went from there. We started watching Blackhawks games, and he started teaching me about the sport as we were watching, like, what's icing? What's this? You know, like, I didn't have a clue. So he started teaching me, and what started off as just kind of like a research endeavor turned into me falling so hard for this sport to the point that now I have, like, two hockey-related tattoos. and. (laughs) <laughs> jerseys and all this like I said I've been to arenas in multiple states I've been to hockey games in Missouri I've been to hockey games just all over like I just fell completely and utterly in love with the sport 
I became a fan because I wanted to write it. That's awesome. I love that, that the that wanting to write the book got you into the game. And Avon, what's your origin story on that? I think I've heard it before, but I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast. <laughs> okay, so my, I'm from the South where no one plays hockey. And when I moved to Missouri, um, my now husband, who was my then boyfriend, took me to a hockey game. I think I've told this story where I kept asking him what would happen if the ice cracked. And he was like, will they bring out the Zamboni? And he's telling me, and I said, well, but like, what happens if it like really cracks? And he's like, I don't understand what you're saying. And then finally he looked at me and he's like, you think there's a swimming pool under there, don't you? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. I thought that there was water underneath the ice. And I was 19, which is probably real dumb of me, but it's true. So I went from that to being able to tell you what like a Corsi statistic is. But I have a very good friend who's Canadian and she used to work late night shifts and she would text me and say, can you tell me the score of the Canucks games? Like she was a big Canucks fan. And so I would like text her the score and she'd be like okay tell me who scored a goal and so I would tell her and so then she's like you should really watch this she'd probably really like it and so I started watching Canucks games to give her updates of what was happening with her team while she was at work and I started getting really into it and then she's like well you're gonna have to pick a team because you have to have one and being someone from a crazy sports family so I understand over investing in sports completely so but I've never been able to like choose my own team so I'm like okay well who's the team everybody hates and at that point, they were like, it's the Bruins. So I said, okay, that'll be my team. Um, and so then that's the year the Bruins beat the Canucks in the Stanley Cup final. So I think I've come full circle, but also she's <laughs> never quite forgiven me for that. But yeah, it was really weird. It's like just by trying to be like a nice friend and like give her some updates. And then I really liked the sport because it moved super fast. Um, I liked the rivalries. And one of the reasons why I became such a big Bruins fan is I love the historical rivalry with the Habs. Mm -hmm. Which is why, I mean, I just love that kind of stuff. It's like, oh. And I started writing um, minor league hockey, which I really like. And we have a team here, and I would go a couple times to see them. And I loved the idea of people playing this, like, really fast, dangerous sport for, like, $500 a week in these tiny arenas with these, like, ridiculous names and then in the South. So right. I was just fascinated by that whole thing, and that's why I ended up writing Scoring Chances was because I was so into uh, minor league hockey. So we'll swing it back around to the writing now. As you got together to work on these books, what, what's been your process around figuring out the plots and then who's writing what and, and how all that meshes together? The first thing we normally do with any new idea that we have is basically talk out the whole story. We, we do like a broad outline of the entire story from start to finish. And then from there, we usually break it down into smaller chapter outlines and then decide either who's writing what chapter or who's writing who. And the way it's worked out for us so far is that we've each, for each book, taken on a specific character. So in Off the Eyes, I wrote Tristan, and in Goal Interference, I wrote Ryu. And um, yeah, we just you know write our chapter, pass it on to the other person. They read and give feedback, and we continue until we're done. Was there any discussion who would write what character or did they just end up speaking independently to you and saying, write me, write me? Um, I, I think, think it was that. With Off the Ice, I was like, oh my God, obsessed with Colton Perego and this whole idea and I really wanted to write him. And then we decided that Seb would be Puerto Rican and you know, you think it would make sense that the Puerto Rican person would write the Puerto Rican character. But since Avon has a background in academia and stuff like that, I felt like uh, she would be better fit for the professor character and so they kind of just each called to us in their own ways and then because I wrote Tristan and Ryu was around during his scenes mostly it just kind of naturally happened mm. that I would write Ryu for the second book is there a scene or part of a scene that the other one wrote for goalie interference that you love I love all of Piper's scenes but one of my favorites in that book is the one where they go to the party and they're having like the, the backyard pool party and Ryu is just not having it with Emmett, and then Morley's being his Morley self. Piper writes the banter with the uh, the team really well. It's like chapters, one of the earlier chapters in Goalie mm. Interference, I just love that whole thing where they go, and <laughs> Sebastian is like, you will call me Sebastian, not you know <laughs> the names they're going to come up with um, for him. So, Cruzy, I think someone tries to call him. But Cruzy. yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love that chapter. And this one is pretty far into the book, but there's a scene where Morley and Emmett have a whole conversation about bisexuality and labels and what does it what does it mean if this or 
and they're discussing, you know, just like relationship issues and like I said, labels and Morley's trying to figure himself out and all this other stuff. And I loved that entire scene so much, everything about it from start to finish. That's probably my favorite scene of Avon's in the book. Thanks, friend. <laughs> what is it about hockey that has actually attracted both of you to writing about the sport? Well, for me, I don't really know much about any other sports. I've I, I've been tempted to write a football duology, and I've kind of got a tentative idea for that. But again, this is another sport where I'd have to like learn it in order to write it because I've watched games with my husband, and I never know what's happening. Like I said, for me, I, I came to the sport because I liked some of the players, and so I was drawn to just wanting to write about these players that played this game that they happen to be playing. And so once I started watching the game and I got into it, it's fast, it's stuff is always happening. And unlike baseball, where it's like you're sitting there for a long periods <laughs> of time where nothing is happening, like, you know, hockey's just like bam, 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 start to finish. And that just appealed to the, the part of my brain that's easily distractible um, <laughs> because I'm very, I can be very just easily distracted. And so a game in order to hold my attention has to be a very rapid pace. And there's got to be a lot of stuff going on. And I just, I don't know, I just fell in love with it. And it, it was the first sport that I ever wanted to write. I think mine is, I grew up watching college sports, football and basketball. And what I liked about hockey was because hockey isn't as super popular as it is, like in Canada, I didn't know the players, but I knew the teams. And I'm so used to cheering for teams um, as like, the name on the, you know, the jersey, not not the player, that for some reason hockey just spoke to me about in that same sort of way. Um, so I really liked the team aspect of it, even though I, so it's almost like the opposite because I didn't know the players. Um, I liked that, but then agreed. I liked it that it was super fast. And also there was fighting, but there was yeah. fighting with rules and like respect. And so people would like get in a fight and then laugh about it and smile afterwards. And there was just, I found something delightful about like, taking on aggression and like having rules of conduct that was all very like, no, no, we were going to do this, but then afterwards I'm going to give you a pat on the back. Like it's absurd in this kind of like wonderful way. Um, and I think we all wish sometimes at our jobs that we could just deck someone and then have it be okay. <laughs> yeah, have it be a <laughs> For sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> which everyone should watch Ice Guardians. It was on Netflix, but it's a great documentary about hockey enforcers, and it will really make you think about fighting in hockey and like what it came from. And I mean, I'm a Bruins fan, so obviously I like fighting in hockey. But <laughs> oh, it's great. We have we actually have matching friend tattoos of a quote we from do. that documentary. <laughs> yeah, we sure do. What's the mm -hmm. quote? With a little more fire, and it would make sense when you actually watch the documentary um but the first time i ever heard it i cried in, yeah me when too you, when you see it in context i would highly recommend that you check that out it's great it's a great great documentary i'll look that up and we'll link it in the show notes as well so people can find yeah. it so what's coming up next for you two together and separately we talked a little bit about the next uh hat trick book but what else is in the offing from both of you well, I have some books that I need to re-release. I do have about like 10 or 11 books that need to be revised and put out there again in the world so that I'm, you know, have my backlist back up and running. Aside from that, I was asked to take part of a cool shared universe thing that I can't share too many details about, but it involves cowboys. I can share that much, and I'm really excited and hoping that I can manage to get that story done and be part of it because everything that I've read about the world building and everything that's involved so far has me really pumped for that. So there's that. And then um, Avon and I have uh, a couple different projects, not, not any official starting dates, but we have a, a book about a couple of bakers that we want to write. And then we hope to get to the sequel to Permanent Ink at some point because uh, we did have two additional books planned in that series. So hopefully we can get get to that eventually uh, and that's all the major stuff on my end right now um i have the ballad of whiskey jacks which is the sequel to um the love song of story of bell that i am working on the six scoring chances book which one day i will finish also i am working with my friend emily rossman and we are writing a kind of ridiculous but fun second chance ex coast guard uh tour guides fall in love in a small town in Alaska book that um, we're actually almost done with. So um, we'll be seeing what we want to do with that when it's finished. And that's, I think, about 
all I could think of. I'd love to do something with like professional wrestling. I got into that a lot. So I'm trying to drag Piper into writing some stuff with me about that. I want to read all that. The Alaska <laughs> book in particular sounds kind of fun. And I'm super excited to know that there's a sixth Scoring Chances book out there. There is. There is. a Xavier's book. I've started it and stopped it a couple times. And I think I have finally figured out for like, the, and I say this for the fifth time, but I have been going back and forth on what the plot is. <laughs> um, I know everything that happens in his story. It's just the, the other half. And I think I'm finally getting a handle on it. So that'll be good because I'd love to get that done and have that out there to have that complete. And what's the best way for everyone to keep up with you two online so they can know when this stuff is coming? I'm at Piper Vaughn on Twitter, and that's probably the place I'm most active, although I've been taking breaks because, you know, all of the doom and gloom news in the world is kind of a lot to take yeah. on Twitter sometimes. Yeah. So I have to take breaks. I, I really love Instagram, and I'm around there a lot, too. I'm, I think Piper Vaughn there. Um, and then I'm on Facebook, too. Search, search the name, and you can find me. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Avon Gale Writes, um, and I take breaks because I get stressed out by Twitter. <laughs> Not it, like just by the world being on Twitter and everything. It's ah. Um, and I just relaunched my website, which is AvonGaleWrites.com, um, and I do have a newsletter, which I think the sign up should be on my website. But Twitter is normally the best way to uh, find me yelling about video games and hockey. So. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we'll link to all that in the show notes. Thank you two so much for being here and best of luck with, with the goalie interference uh, release. Uh, it's such a good book. Everyone needs to go pick that up. Thanks Thank so, you much, so much. Yes, it was fun. This week's interview transcript is brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the author interview for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at biggayfictionpodcast.com. So I actually did a little digging on the Ice Guardians documentary, which is, in fact, on Netflix and will be in the show notes. And the comment about with a little more fire, which is the quote that they got on themselves, actually comes because a uh, defenseman was asked what he might do differently in his career. And his answer was to perhaps play with a little more fire. And I completely see how that would be something to get tattooed on you as an author because we could all mm -hmm. perhaps do with a little more fire in our lives as we go through and do our thing so i am so glad they pointed that out in their interview and i look forward to watching that whole thing yeah let's get fired up okay guys i think that'll do it for this week's show just a quick reminder patreon is a great way for fans to engage with creators of all types and support the kinds of creative content that you enjoy the most we couldn't do this show every week without the help of our super fans on Patreon. The support of our community helps with production costs and ensures that the show is accessible to everybody. If you're curious about what kind of bonus material we deliver to our Patreon community members every single month, just go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Now, coming up next week in episode 210, Jen Hale is going to be joining us and she'll be talking about her latest book, Master of Restless Shadows. Yes, this is the beginning of the end of the Kay Leone series for her, and she has so much amazing things to talk about, both about Master of Restless Shadows and the series overall. Fantastic. So guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and links to everything discussed in this episode, go to biggayfictionpodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday at all major podcast distributors. You can also find us on YouTube. I'm Derek McLean. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.